For, face mask ventilation doesn't sound very sexy. I'm going to try and make it as sexy as I can. Um, the thing that's important for you guys is as being people who <coughs> primarily do advanced airway management through rapid sequence induction, your experience of face mask ventilation is usually when intubation has failed. That means that it's infrequent, that it happens in a circumstance in which you're stressed, and that it happens in a patient with a difficult airway, which means the same anatomical factors that made them difficult to intubate may also increase the chance that they are difficult to mask ventilate. All those factors conspire to make face mask ventilation a very challenging skill for you guys to maintain, and yet it is crucial. Often you'll hear people talking about intubation and breaking it down into components, getting a view of the cords, getting the tube to the cords, passing the tube into care. What I want you to think about today is similarly breaking face mask ventilation down into components. Getting a seal and getting a patent airway. Now this, is, this seems maybe straightforward but it's a really important distinction because if, if your problem is a seal, you'll have a leak around the mask, you'll have no CO2 trace, your chest won't rise and fall. If your problem is the airway is obstructed, you'll have no CO2 trace, the chest won't rise and fall, and you will still have a leak around the mask. Because at some point, if the airway is completely obstructed and there's nowhere for the gas to go, it's got to give somewhere. So even with a good seal, eventually the pressure generator is going to overcome even a good face mask seal. It's, it's, something's got to give, and the face mask seal is the weakest link. So one of the difficulties is, so the only, the only thing that will tell you whether it's obstruction or a primarily a problem with your, your face mask seal is the amount of pressure you need to generate to get the leak around the mask. One of the difficulties with the bag valve mask is that because of the self-inflating bag and the sort of thick rubber it's composed of, the sensitivity of determining how much pressure you're generating within the range that's going to be relevant to making this distinction uh, is pretty low. All or is it? Just come forward here. I'm going to hold this on here. Now you can see that by putting... I'll, I'll hold that. You just hold the mask. You can see that by putting the face mask on a flat surface, I clearly have a good, a, a good seal and B, an obstructed airway. Now, obviously, if I push really hard, you can feel that's tight. That's not usually the kind of pressure we're capable of generating, and we're usually ventilating at sort of 20 centimetres of water. So if I put just a good gentle seal there and you squeeze, that feels relatively normal yeah, to you. Good, yeah. Now, despite that, you've got an obstructed airway and a leak around the mask. Now, if I lift that up and have now I've got a problem, before I had a problem with an obstruction but a good seal, now I've got no seal but no obstruction, squeeze the mask bag, feels pretty much the same. Yeah. You can't distinguish between the two using the BVM. Now this device is called a Mapleson circuit. It is, as Scott Weingart <coughs> correctly says, an archaic bit of um, anaesthetic equipment, but a very useful bit. Clearly that uses the same face mask, the same technique for getting a, a seal. But you can see, I'll get you to come forward again. Well, just again, if I get a seal with this now, and you squeeze, you can generate, hang on, I'm gonna actually get you a seal. You can see the bag fills, and you're able to feel some tension in that yeah, bag. In contrast, if you don't have a seal, the bag goes flat. You guys can probably see it already. There's no, compared to the BVM where we can't tell the difference between a seal problem and a patency problem, it's very, very clear with the Mapleson. Now, people often complain that, oh, but the Mapleson circuit's really difficult to use. It's exactly the same technique. It's squeezing a bag and a seal on the mask. It does have this added valve on it. We're not going to deal with that today, but it's pretty easy to get a handle on. What happens though is people say, oh, but when I use it, I can't ventilate because the bag's flat. The bag's flat because you don't have a seal. The Mapleson isn't difficult, it's honest. This hides the fact that you can't have a seal and this doesn't. Now, whilst it's true, during preoxygenation, if you're holding this on with a good seal and you've got waveform capnography and this bag is going up and down with inspiration, 
um, then you can be pretty confident that you've got a good seal with your face mask. But if you look away for a moment, as Scott Weingart correctly says, a moment of letting air in and your whole pre-oxygenation is ruined. And it's easy for you to not realise that's happened. In theatre we know it's happened because we've got entitled oxygen. You guys can briefly have a, a loss of that and if you don't happen to be looking at the mask at that, or the capnograph at that exact moment, you don't see it. With this, if someone's holding this bag, the instant that mask comes off you can say, we need to start pre-oxygenation again, we've buggered it up. And that does two things. One, it means for that patient you fix pre-oxygenation, but for all your other patient it means that you are gradually finessing in routine circumstances your ability to face mask ventilate and get a seal with a mask. I want you to all just have a go with the face with the face mask. Two hands, I think all of you should be using two hands um, first off and get an idea of just visually that you can see as the airway operator the difference in the mask and that your assistant holding the bag can get a get an idea of the tension in the bag as well. So just all have a go, do it with a good seal and do it with a bad seal and just see the difference. Okay, you guys all had a go? Yeah. Okay, so you can see there, well, I'll just hold the bag on tight and make sure that's closed and you'll see that that, is the gas actually coming out of that? So the, the, other thing this, the other thing this clearly identifies is when you've had a gas failure. So I know you've got yeah, gas got there. Gas so if that bag doesn't come up, you haven't got a seal. Okay, so you see immediately you've got a seal, you can see the bag starts to inflate. You don't have to be ventilating the patient. And Tom, if you just have a gentle feel, you can immediately get a sense that you can get some tension in the bag. Clearly, if you're unable to ventilate the patient now and you're getting a leak, mm -hmm. the problem isn't your seal, the problem is the airway's obstructed. Yeah. Okay, now contrast, so yeah, so it lets you target what your interventions will be, but just have a look, as soon as you've taken that off and you create a leak, you can see immediately that falls. Again, you don't have to be ventilating. This can be, you can be aware of this during pre-oxygenation, but it means that in the situation of failed intubation and difficulty with, with mask ventilation, that you're able to make that distinction between, is my problem the seal or is my problem obstruction? So if you've got an obstructed airway, the bag's gonna be Tight, Correct. And if you've got if you've got a leak, then the bag's going to be flat. But what, what, what are you saying though? Are you saying that we should have these? I am saying you need to think about it. The Good. question I'm asking is why don't you have these? I suppose uh, we always used to have the tea piece in the UK for the kids. Yep. We never had the Mapleson. Yep. Uh, but the tea piece was useful for whenever we had. Uh, so the tea piece is a Mapleson. The tea thing. piece is yeah. a Mapleson F. Exactly. Um, so it's just a different. It all just depends where your valve and stuff is, yeah. and the, the the differences relate to their efficiency of rebreathing with spont venting versus with positive pressure. All really inconsequential to the sort of stuff <laughs> we're doing for just using it around immediate airway management. What's the relevance of the tubing? That just that's a Mapleson C with the short tubing. That's a Mapleson B with the long tubing. Again, it's a different different design. One's more efficient with spont venting as far as rebreathing goes, one's more efficient with positive pressure ventilation. All of them require very high minute ventilations before you start rebreathing, which means unless you're hypermetabolic, it's irrelevant anyway, because if you're hyperventilating, your CO2 is going to be low. The problem isn't rebreathing, the problem is hypercapnia. And even that's only a problem in a specific group of patients when you're dealing with it for the short amount of time we're talking about. So now that we've made this distinction between um, I've just realised we're not timing again, but I, now that we've made this distinction between factors that will, uh, having a problem with face mask ventilation due to seal and having a problem due to obstruction, that allows us to, uh, to target our optimisation strategies accordingly. So if the problem we determine is we've got a, a tense bag, as you said, but, but when we squeeze it, it's leaking around the side, we're saying the airway's obstructed, going to those optimisation headings for for um, face mask ventilation, manipulations. What sort of manipulations could you do to improve an obstructed airway with face mask ventilation? Jaw thrust. So, jaw thrust, when you're using the classical grip, now as I said before, I know that most people are taught to sort of use one hand for face mask ventilation and if it's trouble, if it's difficult, you go to two. For all the reasons I said at the start, it's always going to be difficult for the occasional face mask ventilator. I agree you should be using two hands from the start. The classical technique that most people are taught, your face mask ventilation is coming from your pinky fingers there. Now if you, I'll get you all to have a try in a minute and just see how much can I pull the jaw forward with my 
with my pinky on the mannequin. Not much. So if your primary problem is face mask seal, this is a great technique because you can get your hands right around the edges of the mask and help get a seal. And you might even get another person to help you have a sort of three-handed technique. But if your problem is obstruction and seal is not having difficulty getting a seal, this is not an optimal technique. But if you move to this thumb grip, now I can still get a pretty good seal on the top. But look how much further I can move the jaw on the mannequin. The, the mechanical advantage is extraordinary. Now I would say that if your problem is obstruction with face mask ventilation, you have not had an optimal attempt at face mask ventilation until you've used a thumb grip technique. Now I'll tell you in all honesty, I was shown that by a medical student a couple of years ago during an airway workshop, and I started teaching all the medical students to do it that way. I've since recognised that um, you need to teach everyone to do it that way because it, it, it's not just a technique that's easier for novices, it's a technique that's better. A lot of anaesthetists sort of sneer at it because it's not the classical way to do it. As far as I'm concerned, the way to do it is the way that works. And again, it just makes the point, if you understand what the problem is, you can target your intervention accordingly. Um, I'm probably telling you a little bit how to suck eggs in terms of putting in nasopharyngeals and gadels. My one quick tip on putting in a gadel is you get to that point, I often see my residents then push it in like that, then they reach for the bag. Meanwhile, this comes up like this. The back of it's now sitting on the back of the tongue. It's obstructed and they say that's not helping. I reckon the key thing when you're, when you're teaching or doing oropharyngeal airway insertion is following pushing that back is put your finger on the chin, clamp the gadel between the teeth to keep it in place while you put your mask on and that means it stays in the right spot. Nasopharyngeal airways I'm a huge fan of. Um, obviously there are circumstances in, in sort of head trauma situations where you might not want to use them um, but where they are appropriate one of the things I find is you put them in and you might be familiar with this that you get to sort of that far and you get a sort of resistance. Where you get epistaxis is if you start pushing at that point. What I've found is if you just wait there for maybe 10, 15 seconds, it suddenly starts moving again on its own. So you just maintain a constant pressure, you don't force it, and it suddenly starts moving again. What I imagine might be happening there, I don't know if it actually is, is that the mucosa there of having the pressure of the nasopharyngeal there is sort of being having fluid sort of pushed out of it and then widens the space and lets it go. The second place it tends to catch is then as the, it hits the back of the pharynx. Again, if you haven't got a C-spine injury, making sure you've got a good sniffing position and in any case, making sure you've got good jaw thrust off and gets it around those other things. If you do those couple little nuanced things, it's very uncommon to get bleeding. And then if you, if you can do it, if you're able to prepare in advance for doing that with cofenalcane and stuff, then obviously that's useful as well. That's probably all we've got time for with this. Hope you've